Uh, welcome to El Seminario. Uh, today we have Jose Alonso Solis Lemus as our invited speaker. Uh, he's originally from Mexico City. Uh, he graduated from El Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo de México, El ITAM, in Telematics Engineering and Applied Mathematics. Uh, he received his PhD in Biomedical Engineering at City University of London, and then he joined the Cardiac Electromechanics Research Group at King's College London in early uh, 2019 as a postdoctoral research associate. Uh, thank you, Jose Alonso, for being here, and please, you can take it from here. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Claudia, for inviting me. Um, thank you, everyone, joining in, uh, whether it's now live or if you're watching this on YouTube some, some time later. later. Um, as Claudia said, my name is Jose Alonso Solis Lemus. Let me just write my name properly, um, given that we're in, like, um, in confianza, like, as they say. Uh, so my, my talk is about supporting two patients with a single ventilator. Uh, can it be done? And more importantly, should it be done? Uh, this is actually not my, my original job. So I'm going to talk to you about this little side project that I had um, and also a sor sort of meta of, um, moral of the story about taking opportunities. Um, I work at King's College. Uh, I'm sorry to say I don't have a better uh, photo of it. This is the only photo I have of my workplace. It's St. Thomas Hospital, uh, right in front, uh, like right in front of the Thames in front of the parliament building. It's a very pretty setting. I'm sorry, I don't have a better picture of it. Um, <clears throat> so let me start uh, by telling you what, well, if this is not my real project, um, right, my real work, what do I normally do? And how do I come to this side project? And when I start to the talk, then I'll talk to you about the motivation, uh, some of the medical background, um, and then what proposal we have for uh, using computer simulations to address this problem and how we tested it, what results and what we learned from it. And then at the end, we'll have a, a brief quiz of uh, things you may have not known about uh, Mexico. So uh, as Claudia said, I, I graduated from, from ITAM in Mexico City. Then I was um, lucky enough to get a studentship to come do my PhD in, in at City University of London. And then I started my postdoc around 2019, working at, at King's. What I usually do is I work on image analysis of heart scans, and that helps those scans help my group create computer models, which are very specific to each person. Uh, I work at CMERGE, which stands for Cardio Electromechanics Research Group at King's College. And in this group, uh, we work in all things heart related from the very small protein level all the way coming uh, going through the cell tissue and then finally the organ level and all of these levels are very complicated there's a lot of mathematical equations there's a lot of models a lot of computing power behind it um, and they all have their their um their importances uh so how did I end up this project? Well, uh, my boss was uh, paranoid enough to, to start, uh, start us on lockdown uh, about two weeks before lockdown actually started here in the UK. So I started on the 16th of March. We were having group meetings daily just to check on each other, just to cope with everything, how was going on with the pandemic. And I'm mentioning it because this is why how we came about to this side project. So about one week in into our uh, lockdown, my boss asked if, like, does anyone use, know how to use this software called Simulink? And I had used it uh, some time in my undergrad. So I, I saw no one replied by the next day. So I, I just raised my hand. I said, okay. And within three minutes, I was already in this project. Um, I guess this is the, the point where I tell you about opportunities come in this way sometimes and, and Sometimes you don't even realize, but you just have to put your hand up and just try. <clears throat> and before I start my talk, let me just take a moment to recognize that a lot of people in the world are struggling from this disease and others. So I just want to take uh, a brief moment to acknowledge that this is a disease about people and people are, are struggling. And um, however, I'm, I'm 
I'm just going to carry on with my talk. I just wanted to, to have this disclaimer here. <clears throat> so we're probably all familiar with this flattening the curve thing that became very popular uh, everywhere, uh, which means we wanted to avoid the health systems around the world, wherever you're living, from getting overwhelmed by the amount of cases. Um, and back in April of 2020, at least in Europe and in Asia as well, uh, the ventilator availabilities, so these machines that help support patients, help them breathe, uh, was running low and people were seriously concerned about uh, what to do when or if uh, the number of ventilators available was, would run out. Um, now, sharing ventilator is an idea that has been explored in, in previous, uh, previously. However, it is not advised and it is technically difficult. It is not easy to do that because people are different. Uh, you, they have different sizes, they're different ages, different genders. There's a lot of variation and that means that everyone breathes differently, each individual. So any two patients would not have the same requirements. Um, now, in terms of uh, medical background, uh, we all, we're all fairly familiar with COVID-19. It's a disease that can manifest from something very mild, like a couple of weeks, just resting a couple of weeks, uh, uh, getting headaches, or like a cough, or it can be very severe. And in this case, I want to touch on uh, ARDS, which is a disease which stands for um, acute respiratory distress syndrome, which essentially is a, a disease that affects the capacity of your lungs to expand. So the more severe you have this disease, the less, the harder it is for your lungs to expand, and that really impairs your ability to breathe, right? Um, I want to reiterate here that even though it's technically possible, you should not connect two people uh, to the same ventilator. And this is important here because uh, as, as I mentioned before we were uh, we had numbers rising uh, from from these disease and they were rising very rapidly um, which brings me to my next thing uh, to be absolutely clear uh, the ventilation is strongly advised against if any alternative options are, are available and I do not we do not want to endorse this and we do not want anyone trying it at all uh, however, Given that, oh, sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> Given this disclaimer, if we're in that stage where there's absolutely nothing else to do, we should at least think of a way to do this safely. So can we develop a splitter where two patients can be ventilated with one ventilator, despite different needs from the patients? And the work um, I'm going to describe here is uh, we published it, it's on the QR code if you're interested. Um, but essentially what we're trying to do is give an alternative to, to do this safely, or at least try, or at least try to start a conversation ar around it. Um, so the way we address this problem is we, we are going to look at the similarities between a system like, a, uh, like air passing through a system that involves a ventilator and a patient. And we're going to translate that into the flow of electrical current. So this is not, this is not a new technique. We didn't develop this, but we just used it. Um, and we equated uh, an electrical resistor to a tube, right? Because a tube is long, it's narrow. It causes resistance for airflow, much as the resistor causes electrical uh, flow, uh, current uh, flow, it, it, it stops current from flowing, sorry. <clears throat> uh, then we have on the ventilator, we have one way valves that only allow flow of air in one direction. Whereas in the electrical wor world, we have diodes that do the same thing for the electrical current. Finally, we have a capacitor that uh, is going to be similar to the long compliance that I was talking to, to you about. So with these three elements, well, with these elements, uh, we can create a model for a long, and that's going to be composed of a resistor, which is in the airwaves, and 
a capacitor which is going to represent the lungs. And for us, the current flowing on this little circuit is going to correspond to the airflow and the voltage is going to correspond to pressure. Now we have a, a model for a lung. Now let's, let's make a model for a healthy and an unhealthy lungs. That's, that's, the, that's the next um, step. And you start by, there, there are equivalences for, for this. Uh, so you take a, what would be a healthy lung compliance, and then you reduce that in function of the severity of the disease. And you can do this in many, in as many stages as you want. For us, we tried three stages of a disease, um, mild with a compliance of 80% of a normal value, moderate at 70% and uh, a severe at 60%. Now, what's important for us to measure? Well, we have three quantities. Uh, if I draw your attention to the bottom of, of the slide, uh, we all have two phases when we breathe. We have inhale, inhalation and exhalation. Um, when, and we have three quantities, pressure, flow and volume. So the pressure is going to rise as you inhale and it's going to decrease as you exhale. The pressure ranges from, two, from a minimum and a maximum called a PEEP, peak inspiratory pressure and PEEP, a positive end expiratory pressure. Uh, then the flow goes in two directions. That's why uh, there's a change of sign. Uh, when you inhale, the flow is going in one direction, it's going in, and when you exhale, it's going out. That's why you see that shape of a curve. And finally, um, you have the volume of air uh, going around the whole system, which we need to think because we have a ventilator where we're assisting someone you don't want to put too much volume into another person because that can cause trauma or that can harm that person. So for us, the measurement of, uh, to ensure like an adequate ventilation without causing trauma, that's why we use the tidal volume, which is roughly the, the range of the maximum level that the volume can take. Now, uh, what would a normal splitter look like in the electrical world? And, I hope this is not too, too complicated to, to see. Uh, essentially, we have our two patients uh, on, the, on the right of the screen, and we have the ventilator on the left side. We have switches controlling the inhalation, in, inhalation and expiration uh, stages. So when you're inhaling, one switch is on and the other one's off. And then when you're exhaling, that's the opposite. And we are going to join the two patients with no, a normal T splitter. So we take normal splitter, all the resistors correspond to tubes joining the T splitters. Um, and then this would be the, the standard unsafe way to, to deliver uh, oxygen to two patients. But as um, now what we did for our proposal for this is first of all, we try to make it safe by putting diodes. Remember, diodes only allow flow of current in one way. So that means that there cannot be any cross contamination of the air that one person is bringing to towards the next. And second, to modify or to control um, the air that's going to one person or the other, we added uh, variable resistors. Now, in electrical terms, a variable resistor is very easy to understand. In real terms, it is trickier because this will correspond to a tube that can become longer or shorter or a tube that can become uh, wider or narrower. So that's, that's a bit difficult uh, to think conceptually. However, it's what we went through with. with. Uh, for our experiments, uh, we essentially connect one ventilator to one of the two splitters that I presented, and then we connect that splitter to two different patients. We used MATLAB to, and this library is called uh, Simulink and Simscape, where you can literally drag and drop and construct your circuit, and then you can run experiments on it. Um, but then that was too, uh, too difficult to do. Well, it took a lot of time. So we developed some code. We, we, we wrote some code to, 
to control the circuits like just with with programs and be able to to run a lot of tests without having to go in and drag and drop and change all the values manually. Um, and for the results, we we luckily got what we were expecting. When you have a standard splitter, uh, you can see the tidal volume decreases on the less like on the most unwell patient. Uh, we want to keep the tidal volume at the same level if you're connecting two people to the same ventilator. Uh, but it is not the case when you don't have any control. Now, with our modified splitter, we achieved uh, the same tidal volume on, on both patient one, patient healthy, let's call it, and patient unhealthy. We, we achieved the same tidal volume, and this is exactly what we were going for with this. Um, and it, it was uh, just with a simple uh, parameter tweak. Now, finally, uh, what did we learn? Well, can we do it? Uh, well, the answer is, is difficult. It's kind of, however, it is very difficult because first, conceptually, thinking of a variable resistor of a tube that can elongate or or become wider or, or narrower, it's it's not easy. It's not easy to implement. And there are, this is just the very first step of a lot of tests that needs that need to happen. Uh, we're in stage one. I I give you on the right uh, the website where they're handling all this project and they're trying to push it forward if you're interested. Um, but there's a lot of things that, that's left to do from to take it from, from this, from the from an idea to the implementation I presented you, all the way to a clinical setting. Um, and finally, should we do it? Uh, the answer is absolutely not. This is one of these questions that you want to ask yourself about, but you never want to implement this. The, uh, the, the right uh, way to approach this is to give one ventilator to one patient, right? And we would not never endorse or never want anyone to try this uh, just for the sake of trying it. So that's, it for my talk. Um, I'll I'll carry on. Let's let's carry on to learning a bit about Mexico. Uh, I I don't have a way for you guys to to answer. So it's going to be like a okay. Think of it in your head, and then um, then you you can check if you had the right answer. So uh, first, this is this is a town in in Veracruz called Guayacocotla. That's where my that's my, my grandfather's from on the, my dad's side. So I just thought that was cool. Now, the question is, um, well, you, we, we know that a meteorite hit Earth causing the extinction of the dinosaurs. It landed in Mexico. So the answer is where? And you have some letters next to the circle. So just think of it. And the name of the town today, uh, what's it called? So I'll give you 10 seconds to think about it. Okay, uh, the answer, it landed here in Merida in a town called uh, Shikshulu. Uh, if you got H, that's not Mexico. Uh, so I, I guess that's a minus one. Um, then second question, uh, this is a very iconic image from one of our pre-Hispanic cultures. The name blank comes from the world, word meaning land of rubber in the Nahuatl language. So again, five seconds this time. So the Aztec is, uh, the, the answer is Olmex. Um, it, it's, it's iconic, this image. This, these are massive heads, like tons. Uh, very large ones. Um, you can see them in, in museums across in Mexico City. Um, and finally, uh, well, we have an official language in Mexico. However, there are another number of indigenous languages recognized as native to the territory. So think first of what is our native language and then how many other languages we have in the country. Ready? Okay, so our official language is Spanish. And there are at least, well, at least when I checked 
this, I think this is still accurate. Uh, it's, it's another 68 indigenous languages recognized as native to the territory. So thank you very much uh, for this talk. I'm happy to get your questions and have a conversation. Um, th thank you very much, Jose Lanza. I'm gonna stop the recording now. <laughs>